Hi everyone, welcome to workshop series of AIF 2.0. So today we have Soumya who is taking up the session. Soumya is a blockchain developer who is currently working on different Tezos projects, including decentralized finance and NFTs. Uh, so today's workshop will be on token standards on Tezos. Over to you, Soumya. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, hello everyone. Um, so yeah, so today we are talking about the different uh, token standards uh, that are there on Tezos. So let me just uh, share my screen. Hopefully the screen is going to be. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, um, so yeah, so uh, as, a, you know, as you can see in the title itself, so there are two standards in Tezos. FA 1.2 and FA 2. Uh, uh, we are just talk, talk, going to talk about the fungible uh, tokens today. So there are different, uh, uh, like apart from fungible tokens, there are also non-fungible tokens that exist on Tezos, like any other uh, platform like Ethereum, let's say. So what are tokens, right? So before we jump into different standards, right, we uh, must understand what a token is, right? And why we might need it in our, uh, in our blockchain ecosystem. So uh, tokens, uh, which are also referred as crypto tokens, are units of value that blockchain-based organization or projects develop on top of an existing blockchain network, right? So, um, so you must understand that there's a difference between a uh, native uh, cryptocurrency that is like, for example, on Ethereum, we have ETH, right? So that is a native blockchain cryptocurrency, right? And then we have various other uh, tokens that are built on top of the blockchain. So the difference between these two tokens are basically like the native cryptocurrency is you know, kind of generated by the blockchain itself. Like it's uh, generated after every block is created. So the blockchain network itself is creating these uh, tokens. But on the other hand, the other tokens that exist, like for example, on Ethereum, we have uh, DAI, USDC, LINK, Compound, you know, CryptoKitty and stuff, right? So all these tokens are generated by different projects that exist on the blockchain uh, ecosystem right? so for example DAI and UGC are uh, are stable coins right so these are uh, these these tokens have specific purpose so they do have value uh, depending on uh, you know how you use it so uh, if you go to different exchanges right like uh, probably coin market cap or you know coin gecko or somewhere right? you probably see uh, DAI has a you know one dollar peg and USDC also has a one dollar peg or close to one dollar some somewhere there right and link and compound will have different values depending on uh, the uh, in the popularity of the project itself. So if, uh, if compound is doing pretty good, then compound will have the comp token will have uh, better uh, pricing, right? So so similar to the Ethereum tokens, we also have different you know projects that have issued tokens on Tesla's also, and these uh, tokens that are there are, are following the standards that we are going to talk about today, like FA one point two and FA two, right? So uh, some of the tokens that exist on Tezos today are uh, HTZ, USDTZ, Plenty, KUSD, and there are actually a lot of tokens. I'll just I'll show you later on uh, the number of tokens that are there already existing on the Tezos ecosystem. Even though uh, Tezos is much uh, you know new compared to Ethereum, so so the uh, so the types of tokens uh, that we are covering today that we have already talked about it. FA 1.2 and FA 2. So, what are why are there two different types of tokens, and you know which one you should be using for your project? Like if you're going to work on it, so we should be understanding that first before you know go ahead and choose a token type and then you know, integrate with your project itself. So, for example, um, the FA 1.2 token is uh, suited or was built specifically for uh, fungible tokens. So. A fungible token is basically, uh, you know, a token that you can count basically. So, like, uh, you can have ten of uh, uh, some token, right? So that is basically a fungible token in that sense, right? And uh, this FA one point two is, uh, you know, a very is very similar to if you have worked on Ethereum, right? And if you have worked with uh, tokens on Ethereum, you have probably heard of the ERC twenty uh, standard. So FA one point two is basically the same as uh, the ERC twenty. Uh, equivalent on you know Tezos, so uh, this is used for uh, like in the previous slide. If I if we 
if you see right so each tz usd tz so these are all uh, fungible tokens that are built on fa 1.2 similarly uh, plenty is also uh, built on fa 1.2 right uh, and kusd uh, for also is also actually on uh, fa 1.2 um, so all these tokens are uh, fungible and are based on the fa 1.2 standard but besides that we also have another standard called fa 2 uh, which is majorly used for non fungible tokens even though the standard was uh, based for you know both fungible and non fungible tokens like um, you can have uh, you can build fungible tokens with it you can build non fungible tokens with it or you can have a mixture of both so you can uh, let's say you have a fungible token in the same contract like in the same uh, fa2 contract you can have a fungible token and a non fungible token at the same time so that is uh, the usefulness of the fa2 token fa2 uh, standard um but if you are building specifically for uh, you know fungible tokens right if your project needs a fungible token then i would suggest you go for fa1.2 instead of fa2 because there are some uh, you know features of fa2.2 which are in my opinion better suited for fungible tokens so yeah you can uh, read up on uh, the uh, tezos uh, improvement uh, you know proposals that is it i have mentioned here so the fa1.2 is tz7 and if it is for is it 12 so you can read those uh, standards and you can you know decide better on uh, what type of token uh, you would like to work on for your project okay so um, you know now the question arises like what can i like why do i need the token right so we know that uh, we have these uh, different tokens that exist right so we have a fungible token uh, we have a non fungible token you know and you know we can create those tokens to you know uh, given uh, contracts right so but why what can i do with these tokens in in a project like right? so some of the popular use cases uh, that we have seen for fungible tokens specifically are you know stable coins uh, liquidity pool tokens um dao tokens uh, in game currencies and so on right so stable coins are if you are already aware probably for example uh, in the ethereum ecosystem we saw we saw the dai token and the usdc token right so these are all stable coins so they are basically their value is pegged to a particular you know uh, fiat uh, currency so in this case usd so basically like uh, the one usdc or one dai is supposed to be equal to one usd so that is the uh, like use case for that uh, token similarly liquidity pool tokens are based on uh, for example if you have uh, uh, provided liquidity on uh, any platform let's say compound or um, uniswap or somewhere right so you will in return get these uh, tokens like lp tokens or uh, you know depending on which platform you are on so most platforms are in return for your you know liquidity or for your assets they will provide you with a counter asset like that is a token that is specific to that platform itself so these tokens are uh, used mostly for trading in the platform in that particular platform itself so liquid uh, and you can probably also you know sell those tokens to someone else if that is uh, available outside the platform some market is there for that so liquidity pools are liquidity pool tokens lp tokens in short are used for that uh, dao tokens on the other hand are basically like um, for example uh, we have uh, i think curve dao uh and like there are different projects like so, so all these projects usually have some form of dao or decentralized autonomous organizing like uh, autonomous organization right? so this is basically like uh decentralizing the project itself so the decisions of the project let's say for example uh we have a exchange right so the exchange has some some system fee some uh, liquidity fee and stuff like that right so who decides what the fee should be like for a particular pair let's say so in that case the decision can be made either by you know some central governing like a you know project team the project maintainers or something like that but then that becomes centralized right so to decentralize it you use something like a dao for that and the dao is like people uh, so to vote in these proposals right so dao is basically deciding on these particular configurations for the project let's say like like the uh, liquidity fee uh, or system fee or something like that right so these decisions are made by uh, made using votes and proposals and uh, these proposals and votes are uh, you know put forward by the community 
uh, or the ecosystem members, right? So, and to do the voting, right? To do, to let's say, propose a particular change or you know, to vote for a particular proposal, you need tokens uh, or DAO tokens in this case. Right? So, these DAO tokens are basically your voting, you know, uh, weight weightage basically. So, how much token you are providing for a proposal will depend, uh, like, will might determine, you know, how important the proposal is or how uh, you know how much weightage your vote uh, consists of in a particular proposal, for example. Right? So, uh, so that's a DAO token, and then we have in-game currency, which is very simple. Uh, so there are blockchain projects that uh, blockchain game, blockchain like I mean blockchain-based games uh, that have in integrated uh, you know uh, the cryptocurrency in like blockchain network in its own uh, system. So in these uh, games, you have um, in-game currency, right? So the usual model for uh, a normal game right, that is not connected to a blockchain for example so these coins or these in-game so currencies are not actually you know owned by the you know players or players basically they are stored in the server right so it's basically owned by the uh, you know project uh, maintainers or the you know the game developers right but uh, if you integrate um, the blockchain right if you integrate a blockchain and if you are uh, providing the in-game currency on the blockchain itself, then the users are basically owners of the token, right? So the tokens are not, are not stored on the you know game uh, you know uh, developers servers or you know production servers or somewhere. It's on the blockchain itself, so the users can sell them or you know transfer them to someone else uh, at their own whim. Right? So that's uh, one uh, you know way of looking at uh, tokens. Uh, and integrating with you know existing uh, centralized systems right like games and stuff right uh, some people also allow uh, some people have also integrated uh, cryptocurrencies like tokens into uh, you know uh, online marketplaces where you can actually buy you know physical stuff with uh, these tokens right so those kind of integrations are also possible with uh, crypto tokens so these are just for fungible ones but uh, for non fungible tokens if i talk about non fungible tokens you have mostly uh, nfts so art pieces right so you can convert your art piece to uh, nft and then sell, or sell it on a marketplace you can integrate um, games and have uh, uh, you know in game collectibles so like we have in game currency we can also have in game collectibles for example like uh, if you have played uh, csgo or you know some kind of first person shooter game like that you probably have skins you know uh, or you know uh, you might also have different um, accessories which can be converted to nfts and again just like the you know concept of in-game currency on the blockchain uh, if the if these uh, collectibles are were on a game developer server it again does not belong to the players itself but when it's on a blockchain it belongs to the players right so they can uh, transfer them they can sell it on marketplaces they can do anything like that so yeah so that was uh, mostly the part for you know where you can use uh, these different tokens. Uh, okay, so before we go ahead and try, uh, you can open this link if you want to follow now. But before we go ahead and try, I would like to uh, you know, show the different tokens that exist on the ecosystem right now. So um, this is Kipuswap. Uh, Kipuswap basically it's a decentralized exchange on Tezos right now, and this lists all the different uh, you know tokens that are there on the ecosystem. So you can basically trade for, not trade, I mean exchange one type of token with another type of token. So if I click on select tokens here, uh, we can see uh, the list of all tokens that are existing right now. So here we have, uh, from the beginning of go, right? So, so we have the base currency of the network that is XTZ or TES. So this is the base currency. Then we have the custom tokens that were built on top of uh, Tezos, right? So we have KUSD at the beginning. So that is the stable coin that uh, we were talking about. Uh, so this is a stable coin, uh, algorithmic stable coin built on Tezos. And you can see the standard. It is built on FA 1.2 standard. Then we have wrapped Tezos, uh, which is also built on FA 1.2. Then USDC, uh, which is built on FA 2. And for FA 2 tokens, uh, you will see that there's an ID mentioned. Because every two tokens allow you to have multiple uh, tokens associated in a single contract, uh, you will uh, have to identify a token using the ID itself, uh, not just the uh, 
you know, contradict this. So yeah, so besides that, we have all other different other tokens like TCPTC, Staker, USDTZ, ETHTZ. So most of these are uh, most of these are stable coins like TCPTC, USDS, ETHTZ. Then we have the governance tokens or the DAO tokens in this case, like Staker, uh, HDAO uh, are some governance tokens that are there. Then we have uh, again some kind some types of wrap tokens, which are basically wrapping a token from a different chain. For example, we have Dai, which is a Ethereum based or uh, you know token uh, that has been converted into like brought into Tezos ecosystem using this wrap format. Uh, we also have compound wrapped compound uh, wrapped BUSD like finance USD Aave and so on right. So this is what uh, the wrapped tokens are about. Um, then we have some project specific tokens. So for example, we have the Plenty DAO token, which is uh, a token as, uh, associated with the Plenty project, Plenty DeFi project. Uh, then we have the Kalam token, which is uh, specifically to a project again that is for the Kalam and NFT project. Uh, the, yeah, and we have like a lot of other tokens. You can find them in this uh, website. Cool. Um, uh, are there yeah. any questions? Or? Yeah, Somya, I think uh, could you share the link? They will uh, wanted to. Uh, let, me, let me just uh, share, share the link on the chat. Yeah. Sure, sure. I will share the link. Uh, Great. Okay. Okay. So, uh, coming back to the uh, tokens, right? So, so these are all the tokens that exist right now on the ecosystem. And uh, each of these tokens has some utility behind it, uh, like the project tokens are associated with the project itself. So if the project does, uh, the project is doing good, uh, the value of the token will increase. And similarly, the stable tokens are pegged to the particular asset. So, uh, for example, the USD uh, USDTZ token is pegged to USD uh, USD uh, uh, currency. So basically, it uh, its value should be uh, theoretically equivalent to one USD. Similarly, KUSD is also back to uh, USD. And then we have uh, crypto stable coins like TZBTC, which is uh, back to BTC itself. So one BTC should be equivalent to one TZBTC. That is the idea behind it. And similarly, the wrapped tokens are also uh, kind of stable coins in the sense that you should be able to exchange one uh, you know, one RV with one wrapped RV and similarly one uh, BUSD with one uh, wrapped BUSD, right? Okay, uh, so how do you uh, build these tokens, right? And uh, how do you integrate them with the project? Right? So what we can do is like, we can open up, if you have opened up the link, you will probably get to uh, uh, SmartPy ID, which is the uh, ID that we'll be using for today's uh, session. Uh, and the code that you can see here is the is standard template for the FA 1.2 contract. And uh, you can basically just use this code uh, for your project, right? You can just you know, deploy this code and use it uh, immediately uh, with your project. But uh, this is a standard, uh, like a you know, generic template for the FA 1.2 standard. So if you want to uh, you know, associate some specific logic uh, to the contract, then you'll have to uh, make the changes yourselves. So yeah, so you'll have to uh, know for that, obviously the prerequisite is that you know SmartPy, which is uh, very similar to Python. So you can uh, probably, if I can open up references and see, then you'll probably see that uh, it's not opening up. Okay, I'll share the link for the reference. So you can look at the SmartPy doc and get to know more about the, uh, language itself and then you can start uh, you know making changes to the contract itself so before we actually go into the code uh, i'll uh, probably talk a little bit about the standard itself so if i open up this i should be able to Let me just search for
Yeah. So this is the standard uh, that is uh, the FA one point two standard, which is being used or followed in this particular uh, code here, right? So before you uh, go into the code, you can probably read up the uh, interface that is there for the uh, FA one point two. You don't actually have to follow the code that's here itself. You can write your own logic completely. But uh, for your you know contract or for your token to be qualified as an FA one point two token you have to uh, abide by the interface uh, definition that has been given in this particular standard for that is a tzip 7 so um, yeah so we'll just quickly go through the standard itself and see like what are the compulsory uh, things that are required to qualify your token as a fa 1.2 token or fa 2 token basically so uh, this is a if a tzip 7 uh, documentation and if you start looking from the top you'll see that um, there is a approvable ledger interface which basically specifies all the functions that uh, you must uh, have in your contract so that it is identified as an fa2 uh, token right so the reason why you want to make it standardized and you know you don't want to have your uh, custom uh, you know have a custom uh, interface for your contract is that because you want your contract you want your tokens to be interoperable with different projects so for example uh, Cubeswap that I showed, right? So you might want your project tokens to be available on an exchange like Cubeswap, and that is only possible if you are following a standard specified, uh, you know, uh, already specified, right? So uh, for FA 1.2 tokens, we have uh, these are the entry points, or basically the functions that you can call on the smart contract, and the required entry points for an FA 1.2 token is the transfer function, uh, the approve function the get allowance and get balance functions and finally the get token supply function so the first two functions that are there like the entry points in this case are transfer and approve uh, these are being called uh, as the name suggests right so these are named being called uh, the transfer function is called to transfer the tokens from one account to another so for example if i want to transfer x amount of uh, uh, tokens to someone else and i call the transfer function and i'll pass the parameters here uh, so address is the from address like from whom i'm sending a uh, token so i'll pass my address and then the to address which is basically the destination and then finally the nat value which is uh, the amount of tokens right so uh, you must be aware that if you have worked on ethereum you, you probably also know that decimals are not allowed uh, in uh, uh, in this uh, language so what you have to do is you have to uh, specify the decimals as in so, for example, um, yeah, if you have a token, right, that you want to have, uh, let's say, 10 decimal places, right? So, you specify that uh, the number of decimals for this particular token is 10 in the metadata of the token. But in reality, uh, the amount, like the total supply that you'll be having, right, for example, will be uh, the amount of tokens that you want into uh, the decimal places that you uh, want. For example, in this case, 10, right? So, uh, yeah, so whenever you want to uh, have these decimal things, then you have to make sure that you always uh, do this uh, properly. Because uh, if you uh, if you mess up this, right, if you mess up the decimal places and the amount uh, that you want to transfer, and you know, uh, for example, the amount that you want to uh, mint, uh, also, so in that case, it might cause problems. So make sure of that. Yeah. So we have the transfer function, then we have the proof function. Uh, which is basically if you want uh, to let someone else use your tokens on, on your behalf. So on ERC, uh, on Ethereum, we have the ERC20 uh, token, which also has this very similar uh, function called approve. So what approve does is basically it allows you to uh, approve someone else. For example, I want to approve, uh, let's say Denver, right? So I want to approve Denver uh, to spend uh, 10 uh, uh, tokens uh, 10 USDTC, for example, right? So I'll approve, I'll call this approved entry point and I'll pass pass in the spender address, which in uh, this is uh, going to be Denver's address, Tesla's address, and the value that is 10 USDTC. So again, the value should be 10 into the number of decimal places. So uh, basically uh, 10 into uh, uh, 10 to the power of six, because there are six decimal places in uh, USDTC. So the total value will be 10 into 10 to the power of 6. Uh, and I'll call this Soumya. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you take a look at Rishabh's comment? 
Yeah, sure. Okay. Only your browser screen is being shared if you are showing a demo of the resource pages. Oh, no, uh, I was not uh, showing a demo of the resource pages. That is uh, on this uh, screen. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so so basically the decimal place concept is that uh, if, if you have not understood it again, so if you have, let's say, six decimal places, then you have to multiply the amount that you want to transfer. Let's say in this case, it was 10 USDTZ. So 10 into 10 to the power of six, because uh, you want six zeros behind the actual number, right? So yeah, so that was the concept. And uh, I think it's uh, like uh, pretty, you know, intuitive once you get uh, the hang of it, uh, you probably, and also like most of the wallets right now, uh, do it for you. Once you put in the decimal places, uh, it will automatically include it for you. So you can just write the number 10 and it will automatically multiply, uh, 10 to the power of six with the 10, 10 plus. So, yeah. So, so I was talking about the approve function. Uh, in this case, uh, I was talking about approving Denver, uh, for 10 USD to spend 10 of my USD TZ tokens. So I'll send the approve function with the address of Denver and then the NAT value as uh, 10 USDTZ, which is 10 into the zero six, basically. And that will be sent over. And now what will happen is like Denver can go ahead and make a transfer call and pass in the address, the from address as my address and, uh, you know, and send the 10 uh, USDTZ that I've approved him to anyone else uh, he wants to write it can be a contract it can be someone else's account right because now denver is an approved uh account denver is an approved account right but if uh, denver tries to send let's say 11 usdtz or you know 50 usdtz that won't be possible because i've only approved 10 of my usdtz and that is a limit that has been set and similarly like after the after denver has transferred 10 usdtz uh if he tries to, you know, redo the transfer, like he, if he wants to transfer again, uh, you know, 10 USDTZ or 5 USDTZ even, it won't be allowed because he has exhausted the amount of uh, tokens that has been approved to him, in this case, at this step. Right? So yeah, so, so these are the two main functions that are usually like very much used in, uh, you know, in projects because uh, you will have to approve uh, tokens, you will have to transfer tokens. So uh, approval is necessary because um, what happens is when you want to transfer tokens to a contract, right? You do not directly transfer it through the transfer call because if you do this, right? If you call the transfer function and make a transfer, the transfer will not be, you know, the, the contract that you're being that are transferring the tokens to will not be notified of this transfer actually happening, right? So because uh, the ledger that is there, right, that is maintaining these token balances and stuff is not uh, you know, linked with that particular contract. It is there in this specific FA 1.2 contract itself and uh, the destination contract whom you want to, like, which you want to transfer the tokens to is completely unaware of that. So in that case, what you want to do is like, you want to approve the tokens first. So you are going to approve, let's say uh, again, 10 USDTZ uh, for that particular contract itself. So in the spender address, you're going to uh, put the address of the contract that you're going to, uh, that you're trying to send the tokens to, right? And to approve that particular contract with the amount that is 10 USDTs in this case. And then you're going to call a particular entry point on that contract, right? That is basically going to do the transfer call on your behalf. And by doing that, what happens is, you know, you are basically informing the contract. The, con the contract is aware that you are the person who's sending that 10 USDTZ and, uh, you know, it, you can handle that and you can do a different, uh, you know, different stuff with that on the contracts. So, yeah, so that is the importance of the approve function. Apart from that, you can see all these uh, other uh, functions which are you know, labeled as view. These are uh, basically uh, functions that will be called by other contracts so if there's a contract out there somewhere else right and it wants to know my balance let's say uh, how much balance i have for this particular fm1.2 token then it is going to call this get balance uh, function which is uh, basically going to return the balance of my uh, fm2 if a 1.2 tokens to that particular contract so these view functions are basically called by the contract itself uh, by different contracts and it's not a transaction it is um, basically done during a transaction itself you won't be able to uh, call these uh, you know, directly okay uh, 
Yeah. Uh, also, uh, there's a metadata uh, part to the contract. So if I go back to the code, right, you will see that there's a tzip16 metadata piece, uh, which is uh, the so tzip16 is the standard that specifies the metadata format, right? So uh, all contracts will be for having some kind of metadata associated with it, right? So you can have uh, a description for a contract, you can have a name for a contract, you can have the authors for the contract, you can have different interfaces that the contract is implementing, and so on and so forth. Right? So all these details are available through the contract metadata and standard that specifies how you can format the metadata is the tzip16 format. Uh, you can take a look at the tzip16 format also. I'll probably paste a link, uh, like put the link in the presentation and share the slides. Um, yeah. So in this case, you can see that uh, I have mentioned, uh, like in this uh, example, it's mentioned as smart by FA 1.2 template and description and the authors and stuff, right? So this is um, basically available for anybody to read and um, people can look at the storage. So this is uh, actually stored in the uh, contact storage. So if I can show you the storage, probably I'll have to run this. Okay, uh, I'll run it while uh, it is working. So yeah, so basically it's stored in the storage. So you can read the storage and you can find the metadata that is associated with the contract and you can you know find the different details about the contract. So in this case, if a 1.2 only has a single token, so you can specify the decimal places that a token has in that period itself. And any project out there can just, you know, uh, who's, which is trying to integrate your token can just read that uh, metadata from storage and find that, okay, so there are eight decimal places or six decimal places in your token. Similarly, FA2 standard also has a uh, metadata stand, which also follows a uh, of 16 metadata standard. But in that case, each token that you create in the FA2, because uh, FA2, as I said, is a multi-token contract. So you can have multiple tokens in the same contract, right? So each token will have its own specific metadata associated with it. So yeah, so you can specify that uh, token one has uh, 10 decimal places and you know token one name is let's say uh, ABCD, right? And you can have a description and so on and the icon or something like that. And then you can have token two, which is like five decimal places and uh, you know some different name and stuff like that. So if I open up, okay, so it has compiled. If I open up the output, uh, you should be able to see my metadata. So if I click on this metadata, you can see the whole metadata structure that has been you know, stored in the uh, contract right now. So uh, you already have seen the this thing. So this is the name, description, uh, authors, home page interfaces and stuff. And then these are the views. Uh, basically, uh, these are, mostly for off-chain uh, views basically so that uh, you know off-chain clients like let's say uh, console.js or uh, taquito can make a call to uh, the chain and get the metadata for in this case it's for just for the token metadata so we can get the token metadata by calling this particular view and you can get the structure of the view like the call parameters and stuff from the uh, you know, again the storage metadata for this uh, particular contract Cool. Uh, yeah, you can look at the TCP16 uh, standard uh, to know more about views and the other fields that are allowed in the particular uh, token metadata. And yeah, and if you have any questions, you can uh, post it in the chat. I'll uh, probably uh, see it and look back. Okay, uh, so coming back to the standard again. Yeah, so besides the metadata, we have again uh, the you'll find the descriptions for the different entry points, like what uh, it should be doing, and you know what are the uh, you know errors that are possible like you can also find let's say you don't have sufficient balance so uh, there's a standard error for that so that uh, clients can read that error and understand and you know, parse it basically properly so yeah so different entry points have different functionality and this mentions how uh, you know uh, you can uh, specify the like uh, how you can implement the functions yourself if you want to uh, for approve functions, uh, so there's a how to safely change the alliance. So, uh, okay, if you have worked with Ethereum, you probably know that in ERC20 tokens, if you want to, let's say, re approve a particular token, right? So, let's say you have approved uh, X amount of token to uh, someone, right? And you want to re approve it to make it Y amount of tokens, right? You can just make a call for uh, re approve and you know, pass Y as the parameter now. Y amount of tokens and it will automatically re approve, like change the approval amount from X to Y. But in case of FA 1.2 standard, what you have to do is like you have to uh, first uh, make the approval amount to zero. So you have to send a transaction that 
can change the approval amount to zero and then you have to make another transaction to uh, change it back to the desired amount that you want so if you want to go from x to y amount then you have to go from x uh, then you have to like you have to go from x to zero and then from zero to y basically uh, this is because of uh, a attack vector that exists uh, you can read up on that i'll i'll not go into that right now yeah uh, yeah but if you if you try to do a uh, approval that goes from x to y directly on fm 1.2 then you will get a unsafe allowance change error uh, that will basically show like tell you that you can't make that uh, transaction okay so yeah so that was all uh, for uh, the token standard uh, that we are dealing with here so, so if a 1.2 token standard and now we can go back to the code itself and quickly look at uh, you know the implementation and see what you know what we can do probably to you know make some changes or uh, something like that right so uh, if we start from the top we have the t616 base metadata that is uh, the base uh, you know, the metadata structure that you want to have for your token so if you want uh, a different name then you can put a different name the description the authors and stuff like that here and it will automatically be uh, you know, pulled into the contract metadata that you are going to deploy uh, then we have uh, so okay so so so, so this is being um, you know structured in a python uh, specific manner so you have the classes and then you have functions uh, you know class methods and basically uh, static uh, you know variables basically and you're going to use those across the whole uh, contract so these are not part of the actual contract so these are just uh, you know kind of uh, what do you, how do you, call it? Uh, you know, statements that are written like this for organizing the stuff but in the, in the actual contract right when you compile it when you click on run right uh, smartpy is going to be compiled into the actual um, you know tezos uh, language that is Nicholson, right and that will not actually have these at all. Even like if you just click on run, the compiled, like the intermediate SmartPy code that will be generated will not have these functions, like these classes at all. It will just have the, uh, yeah, just have this FA 1.2 code, which is basically the contract, as you can see, this uh, inheriting the sp.contract, right? So this is the contract itself, and any uh, place where these, uh, you know, classes or these functions are being used will be replaced. And, with the actual piece of code, right? So yeah. So uh, for for just for organization, they have uh, done it like this. So you have a FA 1.2 error class, which is uh, mentioning the different um, you know errors that are possible, like not admin, insufficient balance, uh, unsafe allowance change, and so on, right? Uh, then we have the FA 1.2 uh, configuration. Uh, this specifies whether uh, you have, uh, let's say, upgradable metadata. Uh, you know token metadata of chain view and stuff like that so basically upgradable metadata means that uh, do you want to allow your metadata to be updated later on after the contract has been deployed or not and off chain metadata view is like do you want uh, your basically the view that we saw right the view in the uh, metadata right so this view do you want to have this view or not right so that is what uh, these two parameters are doing then we have the FA 1.2 common, which is uh, again some helper functions that are used to normalize the metadata. Not not the not that important in this case, but the most important code is the actual contract that is there FA 1.2 code. So this uh, code itself has all uh, the different entry points that we are talking about: the transfer function, uh, the approve function, and uh, the view functions: the get balance, get allowance, uh, get total supply. These functions, right? And with that, we also have another um, class, which is basically inheriting these, this core contract, which allows you to have the mint and burn functionality for your FA uh, 1.2. So the mint and burn functionality is not a standard, as in it's not compulsory to be added to your contract. You can have it or you cannot have it, it's up to you. So if, uh, if you want the ability to mint uh, tokens uh, while, uh, you know, uh, dynamically, let's say so, uh, for example, LP tokens, right, have this mint functionality. So whenever a person deposits um, some amount of uh, liquidity to a LP uh, liquidity pool, then the LP contract is going to mint them some LP tokens. So that is required. And similarly, if you remove your liquidity from the LP tokens, it will burn the token. So these two functions are required for those kind of projects, right? 
and apart from that we have the fa uh, 1.2 administrator uh, which is basically adding in admin functionality to the code right like set administration uh, state administrator get administrator and stuff like that right and if you if you want to pause is basically uh, similar to the administrator uh, class itself because it is implementing some control like control mechanisms into the contract itself so these are not so these are uh, you know last few classes are not the standard as in you can add them if you want but it's not going to be like compulsory it depends on whether you want those functionality or not so let's uh, i don't think there are, there is anything else apart from that yeah so we have the token metadata which is uh, again just implementing the metadata view functions and stuff like that and yeah yeah then we have the testing right so moving back to the core uh, contract right if you want to code we'll quickly go through uh, the logic that is there uh, in the contracts and uh, if you and whether you want to you know depending on the project that you want to work on uh, you might be wanting to make some changes in the you know uh, this particular code itself or you can also inherit the code like uh, they have done in case of FA 1.2 Minton and bond, right? So they're inheriting the code and adding functionality on top of that. So you can also do that if you want. So talking about the code, we have uh, the actual interface functions that are compulsory for your contract to be declared as, you know, or considered as FA 1.2 standard. So we have the transfer function, which is um, basically um, storing, uh, you know, updating the ledger that is there. So if you look at uh, the init function for this FA 1.2 code, right, you will see that there's a balances um, big map. So again, like you'll probably have to have some uh, smart by background before you can actually look at the code, understand it. But uh, just to give a, you know, for those who do not know what big map is, it's basically like a, uh, you know, Python dictionary, uh, which or a G uh, or a JavaScript, uh, you know, dictionary basically, or an object basically where you have a key and a value. And in uh, in big maps, you have to mention the type of the key and the type of the value, and all the key values that are going that are going to be stored in the big map have to be of the same type as the you know initial types that you have set, right? So in this case, you can see that we are initializing a big map for balances. So this is going to be the ledger that is maintaining the balances for the different users, right? So uh, we have the value as key record, which is basically like a uh, you know, a collection uh, of, you know, again, uh, specific key values. So in this case, we have a T record of uh, approvals, which is of type T map again. Uh, the big map and map types are almost the same. So big map is basically uh, more efficient than a map. Uh, it uh, basically it is not indexed uh, properly. Like, you won't be able to just you know call the storage and get all the big map entries so you have to make a call specific call to get a, a particular big map entry right but for a map uh, just a simple map you can just make a call to the storage and you can get the complete map from there so that's the basic difference between big map and map you can read up on the documentation too so like no more so yeah so in the balances we have approvals uh, the value that is being stored in the big map is basically a record of approvals and a, a balance basically so okay let me just uh, this will be better at this if i can open up this website we could probably see yeah so if i click on let's say uh okay i'll just search for your easy that will be faster so this is the yeah. so this is a USTZ contract uh, which is again based on FA 1.2 standard and if we look at the storage right so this is the storage that we are talking about right now the balance system and if we look at the storage uh, we'll see a thing called ledger here so this balances and the ledger is basically the same thing it's just uh, you know name different so uh, if I look at the, you know, so this is the big map here. If I look at the things that are inside it, we can see the details here, right? So we have a key, which is basically the address. So in this case, I think the key is not mentioned. 
but the key key value is basically uh, the address of the user whose balance or you know whose details you're going to store in the particular big map right so this is a key for the user and then you have the value part where you have uh, two variables uh, like mentioned in the uh, storage you have the uh, balance uh, variable where you are you are storing the actual token balance for that user uh, which is a nat type and then you have a map so in this case this user does not have any approvals let's search for a user who has at least some approvals okay this is going to take some time let's just look at the operations and find uh, any approved call right so let's say this one right so this user has uh, made a proof call let's see if i can just search for this user in the storage when i search for this user okay it's, it's coming as a zero anyway so if i look at this uh, operation itself right so in the ledger again uh, you can see this is the ledger and this is a key for the user that we were talking about then we have the balance which is the uh, value that is there inside the uh, big map so this is an add value that is the balance of the tokens and then in the approvals which is a list of maps again we have a map of address and balance again so the address is the spender's address if you remember the approved entry point right you send the approval uh so spender's address and then you send the amount number of tokens that the spender can use so in this case we have the uh, contract address which is the spender and then the number of tokens that the spender can be using so that's be basically being stored in the balances of the ledger uh, big map right and then we have a total supply which is uh, basically specifying like uh, let's see if, it, if this contract has a total supply so yeah so you can see the total supply right so this is basically mentioning how many tokens have been minted till now so uh, if there are 100 tokens in circulation for that particular you know contract then you see that 100 as uh, the total supply in fit right so yeah so that is uh, what the storage looks like and then the uh, functionality that comes in like the transfer functionality is basically going to um transfer like deduct uh, it's not actually making any transfer transfers in the sense like it's not actually transferring tokens or anything uh, that you would expect in in a normal you know base cryptocurrency right like ethereum you, if you're transferring then there's actual transaction going on but in this call when you're making a transaction for the transfer call it's just updating the ledger itself nothing more so it's going to uh, you know deduct the balance so in this case you can see that uh, this is deducting the balance from the from address and it is updating the adding the extra like the transferred amount to the to address in this case and also in between it is also checking um, whether uh, this is a approval call or not like uh, i mean like whether uh, this token has been approved or not so in this case you can see that if the parameter form is not the spender so basically that means that uh, this call is being made by the spare like the you know approved spender not the actual owner of the tokens then it's going to go to the balances and then the approvals and finally deduct the amount of tokens that are approved from the list right from that particular spender so that is the logic for transfer like very simple uh if you want uh, for uh, make custom changes to the code for example um in some DAOs you will have uh flash loan resistance added to them so in that case what you want to do is you want to uh, like what they do is like they have a list of uh you know uh, they keep the history of the transfers that are happening for the particular account so the balance of the account is you know taken over a period of time and that average is used as the weightage for the DAO proposal voting part right so that you know uh, you cannot uh, get a sudden flash loan and make a vote with a large amount of weightage right? so that's the idea behind that if you want to make non-transferable uh, tokens then you probably would like to remove this transfer function completely or you know restrict it to you know allow only transfer to particular addresses for example a particular contract or somewhere like that right? so those are all possible so you can update the transfer function according to your logic and that would work fine uh, then we have the approved functionality, which is uh, basically just up updating the you know bal up approvals like the ledger approvals for that particular user, and then adding the value that you want to you know approve. And also, as I said, like un unsafe allowance change. So this check is there in the SP.verify, and uh, this is 
you don't want to remove this check because uh, it is part of the standard like it's specifically mentioned in the standard so you do want to keep it there but even if you remove it uh, i don't think that will uh, you know uh, make it non standard if you want to but it's better to keep it there uh, just to be safe uh, apart from that yeah we have uh, the view functions which are basically returning the balances for the user and uh, the allowance for the particular account so these functions are also there in uh, like similar functions are also there in ERC20 standard in Ethereum. Uh, it's basically kind of uh, the same uh, functions here too. Uh, then we finally have uh, like, like then coming to the mint and burn. Like so, these are the uh, changes that you want to make on top of the you know uh, contract, right? So in this case, they have added mint and burn. Uh, you can add your own custom functions. So for example, uh, if you want to have uh, um batch transfer right so you want to transfer multiple uh tokens at the same time so that is not available in fm 1.2 standard but it is there in fa2 standard so what you can do is you can add that functionality uh, as an added entry point and uh, as long as you have the you know the necessary functions or necessary entry points that are required for the fm 1.2 standard you can uh, still use it right and uh, specifically that will be used by your own uh you know, custom project that you're you know, wanting the tokens to be used with, right? So yeah, so in this case, we have uh, they have added the mint and burn functionality, which is basically minting tokens. So for this to happen, you need to be an administrator of the contract. So for this uh, to work, you need to be you need to have the permission to add the tokens, right? Mint the tokens. Uh, you can mint the tokens to anybody, and it is added to the total supply and the balances. Similarly, for the burn, uh, uh, the burn can be uh, called by the admin again, like no one else can call it. This is a security measure because you don't want to allow users to, you know, burn someone else's token, right? So that's why the burn is there. You can probably change it to, you know, allow users to burn their own tokens so that, you know, if they want, let's say, to make scarcity of the token, right? Scarcity. So they'll just probably burn the tokens and uh, that should be uh, possible, right? So you can make the change here if you want. Uh, but this basically simply um, deducts the tokens from the balance and uh, removes the token from the total supply too. So unlike the transfer function, which does not update the total supply, the burn will burn and mint will update uh, the total supply. Uh, the admin uh, sections are uh, these are very common. Like these are not uh, like these are not specific to the FA 1.2 or FA 2 contracts. These are found in many uh, other contracts also. So you probably would like to have some kind of administration or administrative functionality attached to your contract, right? So that if things go wrong, you can probably pause the contract, or you know you can uh, make some specific uh, entry point calls that can you know prevent any uh, form of damage. So it's a very very important, at least on the initial stages, uh, at the initial stages of the project, to have some kind of uh, you know uh, uh, administrative uh, functionality. Later on, uh, when your project has you know uh, matured enough, you can probably remove a centralized administrator and make it a attach a DAO to the project. So basically the admin address, address would be like a multisig uh, contract or a DAO basically where that contract, uh, the DAO contract would be doing a voting uh, for the particular you know, particular function that needs to be called or the entry point that needs to be called. And then depending on the votes, uh, the call will be done. Uh, so it's not basically administered by a single person. So yeah, so um, in the ad, so administrator functionalities, we have a set administration administrator, which is basically setting a new administrator address, uh, which can then be uh, which can which address can then call the different admin specific functionality like mint and burn, uh, for example. Um, then you have the uh, I think view function to get the administrator, which is again for the context to see who's the administrator. Uh, then finally, we have the pause functionality, which is uh, very necessary again. Uh, like the administrator, so you want some kind of, like I said, you know, flood, like like a gate to prevent, uh, you know, uh, you know, bugs or you know, problems in your particular contract, right? So once you've deployed a contract, it's not possible to change the code on the uh, blockchain unless until you deploy a new contract and uh, use that. So it's always good to have some kind of pause mechanism in the contract. So that if things go wrong, you can just uh, the administrator can just call the pause and pause all functionality of the contract, and then uh, probably using the admin functionality retrieve the funds for the user or you know do the necessary things so that uh, users are not harmed. So yeah, so it's uh, 
it's a good idea to have the set pause functionality. So uh, this is basically going to set the pause value, which is then probably used in the different calls. So if I look at this function, so yeah, so there's a is post uh, utility function that has been created here, which is then used in all the different uh, you know uh, entry points. So in this case, uh, the transfer is checking whether the contract is paused or not, and if it's not if it is not paused, only then it goes and does uh, whatever uh, you know it, is, it should be doing. Similarly, the approve function also has the paused uh, check before it is going to do anything. So it's good to have the pause everywhere, uh, you know, every functionality or every entry point that you have. So so that you can, if you want, you can pause all the entry points and, uh, you know, retrieve the funds or secure the contract basically. So apart from that, we have uh, the token metadata, which is basically setting the metadata. So, so this will uh, update the token metadata that's there. So if I can, um, Yeah, so, uh, okay. Yeah, so basically the thing about this is just uh, setting up the contract metadata. So you don't actually have to make any changes in this one, unless you want to change the format of the metadata that you already have, right? So yeah, so similarly the contract metadata and the token metadata. So there are two metadata. So if I open up the, okay, so this one does not have the metadata, but probably KUSD will have the metadata. Let me just search for it. Yeah, so here we can see that it has a metadata and a token metadata. So this is also FA 1.2, as you can see. Uh, so the metadata is basically the metadata for the contract itself. So this specifies what your contract is going to be called. So in this case, this is a value you can see, right? So this specifies the contract name like QP swap liquidity, KSG and description and stuff like that. Whereas the token metadata is basically specifying token specific details like uh the balance uh like not the balance uh, the decimal places of the token the icon of the token uh the symbol of the token and stuff like that right so yeah so that was uh mostly it for the fa 1.2 standard and uh while integrating what you need to do is like uh, uh if you want to make a call from a different contract you have to make a contract call so sp.contract and then uh, make a sp. Uh, send call i guess uh yeah or transfer sorry you have to call SP transfer, and then that will basically make a contract call for you from that particular uh, you know, other contract to this contract. So you can call the different entry points that are there, like transfer entry point or approve entry point or you know mint entry point and stuff like that, right? So while integrating, you just uh, basically do the same thing that you're going to do with a um, JavaScript client or you know wallet, right? Uh, and finally, uh, for the wallet, I I have like two minutes left, so. So for example, I have, uh, I'm on the Florence testnet right now. And you can see that I have different uh, testnet tokens. So this is a testnet uh, Tezos, which is a base currency. And then we have testnet Kalam, Pell Plenty, and you know, wrap tokens and ETHTZ, USDTs and stuff like that, right? So what you can do is like, if you build your own token and if you deploy the contract, right? So uh, SmartPy has an option to deploy the contracts. And if you want to you know, check the balance of your token, con like token, uh, that you have deployed and stuff. So what you can do is you can click on manage and uh, if you're using temple wallet, that is in that case, click on add and you can choose the type of token that you want to add and then you can just paste in the address. So in this case, for example, I want to, you know, check up KUSD, which is on Edonet. I don't think I can check that probably. Is there any Florence net? Yeah. So this is on Florence net. So I can take this and uh, take the address and paste it here. So it should automatically, if you have the proper token metadata, it should automatically take up the, you know, uh, the symbols and decimals and everything. So here you can see the symbol has been taken up, the name of the contract has been taken up, and the decimal. So this decimal is probably not correct. So uh, you might have to make the changes, and then you can just add the token, and that will add the token to your account. So here you can see there are zero tokens because I don't have the token, but. Uh, once you have the tokens, you can uh, you see the balance popping up here. Yeah, so that was all for uh, the token uh, specification. If there are any questions, then we can probably uh, take them up. I do not see any questions right now.
yeah i think uh, you know you folks can you know ask anything that you did not get so far feel free to unmute yourself also it's like uh, how does fa2 token work you said that's a thing called mix uh yeah, like you can mix fungible and non fungible together in the same contract right uh, okay let me just share my screen back so okay so if i look at the one second i'm not sure it's going to help so uh this is a wrap token uh this is a wrap protocol governance token that's there right and uh if you go into the token side and you you see that uh, there is there are you know the different tokens that are there right now and you can see the decimal places here right so this is 8 but the uh, uh, standard is fa2 even though the standard is fa2 you can specify the decimal places that you want for a particular token to have so in this case this is a fungible token and not an nft like a non fungible token and that is why it has the decimal places and you know uh uh you know symbols and everything like that right and come then you are uh but if i let's say go to um let's say let's so this is a, a nft project uh for uh, that is there and okay, there are no contracts here let me just go to mainnet and then search for objects yeah okay i can't find the contract itself apparently but Okay, let's see this one this one will probably have some contract yeah so this token here you can see right so this is a probably a test to test contract for this particular project right so in this case uh, there is just only one token in this case also but the decimal place is zero and we have other uh, metadata specific details for this particular token uh, this one is not a fungible token but this is a non fungible token and again the standard is fa2 so here we can see the artifact uri the thumbnail uri and stuff like that right so these are specific to you know nfts right we have a picture there and that's been stored on the blockchain right here and because there there cannot be any decimal places for an nft right you can have uh, amount associated with it uh, but you can't have a decimal place associated with the nft right so in this case uh, it is decimal place is zero uh, and uh, the amount is probably uh, set here yeah so the amount is like 99 uh, and one so 100 tokens of this has been generated so object is uh, the nft project object is basically allowing you to have amount associated to the oh. nft itself but uh, what you can do is like uh, usually like usually won't see amount being associated with an nft it is just like a single uh, token that you can either transfer or you know burn if you want and uh, sell so yeah so that's usually how it is uh, done and by mixture i mean uh, what i meant is like you can have uh, so so the standard of the contract right this fa2 standard is such that you can just have another uh, token that is a, that is that was similar to the wrap thing right uh, with this one and with a different id like this was id 0 probably and we will have probably id let's say 1 or something like that and at that at that token the decimal places will not be zeros so it will be like 8 or 10 or something like that and these different artifact or anthem will or i will not be there right so that makes a token not an nft but a fungible token in that case, right so you can have a mixture of uh, fungible tokens and nfts in the same contract even though like uh, you know like they are being used in a different way altogether but you can still put them together uh, so if you have let's say a uh, uh, nft project that you're building and at the same time you want to have a dao token which is fungible right the nft tokens are obviously non fungible and the dao token is fungible right and you don't want to have separate 
contracts for each of the tokens, then you can just put them together in the same FA2 token and FA2 contract, and that should work out of the box. That is basically what it means uh, to have uh, mixed tokens in the uh, FA2 standard. Uh, does it answer your question? Yes, it answers. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, like, uh, we are uh, minting a fungible token. So, like that way, if we uh, mint uh, non fungible tokens to a particular address, so, like, uh, what are what is the logic uh, behind assigning a particular NFT to a particular address? So, uh, okay, I did not actually talk about the FA2 standard today uh, because it was mostly uh, about fungible tokens, and FA2 is usually used for you know, non fungible tokens. But I'll just. Uh, so I'll just uh, show you the code again. So uh, hopefully my screen is visible. So this is the uh, FA2 standard. Uh, again, uh, you can just go to template uh, SmartPy IO ID uh, question mark template equal to FA2, and you can go through it. And uh, to be specific about your question, like what happens like when you mint a token or you know transfer a token. So if I just search for mint in this case, uh, okay, I will click here. Yeah, so this is the main function entry point being called. And if you go to the code, you finally see that um, there's somewhere in the ledger, right? So here, so you can see the ledger here, uh, that is a user again. So this ledger is very similar to uh, the FA 1.2 standard. It, uh, it does have some difference, uh, like difference in structure, but the idea is that this user is going to have a ledger uh, where you are going to put in the amount of FA2 tokens that are being generated for that particular ID. So if I go to this one, right? So so there FA2 has a like a kind of a different ideology of having fungible and non-fungible. If you're using the standard format, what FA2 does is like if you're not using the mixed thing, right? If you are specifically going for fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens, uh, specifically like that. Then, if you are just going for non-fungible uh, fungible tokens, then what FA2 will do is like it will act very similar to FA1.2, and uh, the structure of the ledger will also look very similar. Like the key will be the user's address, and in the inside the key you'll have inside the value you'll have uh, the uh, the balances and stuff like that, right? But if you are going for the fungible version, you what you see that if you go to storage, right? I have only one token here, but if I open the ledger here. You see that it's a pair, not a single address in this case. So you can see that there's a pair and then 152 like that. So this pair is basically uh, like a tuple where you have the address and the token ID. So the token ID here is 152. And if I open up, you'll see the key that is properly that is the address, which is a part of the pair, and then the uh, ID, the token ID, which is 152. And finally, the value, which is one. So in case you want to mint a token, right? What will happen is like uh, the mint function will just create a entry in this big map ledger, uh, which whose key will be a pair of address and the token ID, and the value of the key will be either one. If you are minting, usually NFTs will be like value one only. But if you have uh, because it's a you know a, like flexible standard, you can have multiple uh, number of these NFTs. So you can have an amount greater than one also. So that is also listed here. And in case of a mixed version where you have, you know, FA2, like not FA2, sorry, fungible and non fungible at the same contract, then also the same format will be used. But uh, what will happen is, uh, again, uh, because uh, the token value is here, in this case, the token value will not be, in that case, uh, for the fungible one, the token value will not be one. It might be more than one, like 100, 200, or something. And for any user who's holding that particular token, right? So, for example, in this case, we can see, right? So we have a user uh, with the address, uh, uh, like if I close this one, so these addresses are different, you can see, right? So if I click on this, the address is this, but this user is also having uh, token number 152, uh, that is the ID of the token, but the address is different. It is a contract address in this case. So in case of the fungible one, uh, there will be pairs of these values, uh, like keys being generated where there will be address and the ID of the token. So that is creating a unique pair a uh, unique key for that particular map. And then the value will be mapping to the amount of balance that particular uh, user has for that particular token. So uh, does that uh, 
answer the question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone? Yeah, if there are no other questions, uh, I think we can wrap up for today. And I think, Swamya, you'll be there in the uh, Slack, right? Yeah. To help out. Yeah. All right. Um, it's, uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining in. Thanks, Soumya. Also, okay. yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.